So imagine the following situation. You've got a young boy, let's name him Lucas, and he lives in a fairly small town with not a whole lot to do. And he's kind of close to a bigger city with something to do. The problem is to get there, he would have to trek through the tall grass. And the problem is young Lucas doesn't have a Pokemon. So if he were to walk through the tall grass, he would be putting himself in pretty significant danger. Eventually, a kind old man from the next town over manages to give him a Pokemon. However, until that point, Lucas is basically isolated. If he wants to go to the big city, he has to ask his mom, who has a Pokemon, who can safely escort him to the city. Now, if that sounds at all familiar, that is because that is basically the Pokemon equivalent of what most North American children experience growing up. Just replace the Pokemon aspect with cars. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the design of the cities in various Pokemon games and compare that to that of some American cities and sort of what we could potentially glean about what makes a good city from these games. Now, before I start, there obviously is going to be a bit of a limitation to this, mainly due to the fact that many Pokemon games use this top-down 2D view, which introduces a lot of abstraction into their city design. So it's not necessarily emblematic of what a full city looks like, but it still might give us a few ideas. Going forward though, this video is going to be split into two parts. The first part is we're going to look at maybe some of the problems that are apparent in most North American cities, and then move on to looking at what makes a good city and what Pokemon games have good examples of these. And if this is something that interests you and you want to see more videos like this in the future, be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more content in the future. As well as if you want to support me financially, you can either do that by becoming a member of the channel or doing so on Patreon. Link to that below in the description. So what is wrong with most cities in North America? So the answer to put it simply is cars. And what do I mean by that? So over the past several decades, the American city has transformed to become centered around personal automobile use. That is, the design of most cities has essentially necessitated the ownership of a car to get around. This design has brought a lot of issues for cities. One such example is due to the fact that cars make it easier to go longer distances, our cities have spread out in a phenomenon that's sometimes referred to as suburban sprawl. And the issue with a lot of these sprawl type neighborhoods is that they're not really financially solvent. So when they're first built, they draw in a lot of revenue with stuff like permitting fees and local taxes. The major problem is with these developments, as time goes on, it turns out that after those initial fees are paid, the amount of property taxes that these neighborhoods draw in, just due to their lack of density, isn't enough to actually maintain the infrastructure that surrounds it. Charles Marone, the founder and president of the organization Strong Towns, puts it this way. Over a life cycle, a city frequently receives just a dime or two of revenue for each dollar of liability, a ridiculously low level of financial productivity. And this ends up collapsing usually around 25 years when major revisions need to be made, usually at the end of a road's life cycle. And so how do most cities deal with this problem of cash flow? Well, simple, they build more suburbs, which is what Strongtown refers to as America's suburban Ponzi scheme. Beyond just the tax revenue side of things, the usage of cars is probably one of the most dangerous things we do and is kind of detrimental to our health as we've seen from many sources. Research has shown that those who have long lengthy car commutes have twice the risk of obesity as those who don't. As well, one in three long distance commuters report having neck pain issues. Beyond that, research tends to show that we're more socially isolated from each other the longer our commutes are. It's also been shown in couples where one partner has a commute of 45 minutes or longer that that couple is 40% more likely to get a divorce. So in some, cars make us fat and miserable. And that doesn't even get into the deadly aspect of it. Driving is one of the riskiest things we do on a daily basis. It's been estimated that one fatal car accident occurs about every 15 minutes. On top of that, pedestrian fatalities have hit a 40 year high in the States, which many attribute to the rise of larger, heavier vehicles on our streets, namely the SUV and the pickup truck, which now make up three quarters of all new vehicle sales in America. And there's two reasons as to why these cars are deadly. One is that because they're higher off the ground, 
They strike the pedestrian in the waist, or in the case of a child, in the head, which is more likely to lead them to get knocked over and run over. Whereas a sedan, by its lower hood design, will deflect a pedestrian up onto the hood, which is still bad, but significantly more survivable. The other issue is that these higher off the ground cars have massive blind spots. NBC News did a demonstration at the Consumer Reports test track and found that when lining up elementary students in front of an SUV, you had to line up nine in a row before the driver could see the top of the head of one of those kids. It's not just the size and weight of cars that make accidents so deadly, especially to pedestrians. The other is the speed that the cars are going at. A lot of North American cities have been using highway standards for city streets, which creates a lot of problems. Strong Towns refers to these as a strode, which is a portmanteau of the word street and road, referring to the fact that they try to achieve the use of both. Strodes are a mashup of these two types of paths. We call them the futon of transportation because just as a futon is neither a particularly good bed nor a particularly good couch, a strode is neither a particularly good road or a particularly good street. Beyond just that, there's also the case of many downtowns which have installed massive freeways cutting through the center of them which tend to be worse for the health of those that live directly adjacent to them. The American Lung Association notes that living close to these highways significantly increases your chance of premature death from lung-related illnesses. And beyond just all that, cars tend to be fairly space inefficient in their design. They take up a lot of space to carry one, maybe two people to a destination which leads to the issue of traffic. And obviously alleviating congestion is a huge focus for a lot of cities. Unfortunately, the route they go on is usually by expanding the number of lanes on major roads, which is notably known not to work due to a phenomenon known as induced demand. To sort of explain this phenomenon, is what happens is when you increase the capacity of a road, it tends to give you the idea that, hey, there's more lanes. This is gonna take me less time to get somewhere now. And sure, for a time, that'll be right. The problem is that you're not the only one thinking that. Everyone else is. So over time, the road tends to clog back up. And despite decades of research that back up that this is a phenomenon that happens without fail when it comes to highway expansion, we still do it. In his book, Walkable City, famed urban planner Jeff Speck says the following. Induced demand is the great intellectual black hole in city planning. The one professional certainty that everyone thoughtful seems to acknowledge, yet no one is willing to act upon. It's not just the fact that these roads invite more vehicles onto them by their increased capacity, that create congestion. Because ultimately, road traffic is created by conflict points, which Alan Fisher in a recent video explains that sure, you add more lanes to the highway, but ultimately the places people are actually going to aren't on these super wide highways that you just expanded. They're on smaller city streets. So ultimately, no matter how many lanes you have, there is always going to be a bottleneck to those final destinations. And so beyond just having our general urban planning being designed around sprawl type neighborhoods, we tend to see that their design essentially necessitates owning a car. In an interview with NPR, Speck says the following, your car is no longer an instrument of freedom, but a prosthetic device. What he means by that is that the design of most suburban streets tend to involve long lengthy loops and dead end streets, formerly known as cul-de-sacs. And while many tend to perceive these neighborhoods as safer due to their decreased through traffic, it turns out that statistically that's not the case. And these neighborhoods are actually deadlier to children than traditional city streets. On top of all of that, cars represent a pretty substantial financial burden to all American households due to the fact that they are essentially required in all but a few cities. In January of this year, a report came out revealing that more Americans than ever are paying over $1,000 in car payments. That's a pretty significant cost per month for the average American family. And yes, the recent increase in interest rates is a part of that. But at the same time, what the fuck are you people buying? My payment is like below $500 and I think I got ripped off. So like, What type of cars are you guys even getting? On top of that, it also was revealed that car insurance premiums went up 15% in the past year, an average of $240 per year, which is a fairly small amount of money in the grand scheme of things, but it's still a pretty significant financial cost, especially due to the fact that car insurance is a thing you are required to have in order to drive a car which again, as I've already noted, is something you have to do in most American cities. And obviously there's also been the fact that the cost of fuel is a pretty significant part of that as well, with there being a 
huge, huge coverage over the fact that it hit $5 a gallon last summer, which is absolutely insane. And the experts have ultimately noted that higher gas prices tend to have an adverse effect on the economy due to the fact that everyone buys it. But that's enough about perhaps the problems with American cities. So let's move to one, talking about Pokemon, but two, what makes a good city? So ultimately, what makes a good city is one where a car is not required to get from point A to point B. A walkable city, as this video might have already been implying. And to do that, you have to make sure that pedestrian safety is at the forefront of your concerns. And it's not just statistical safety that you need to look into. Pedestrians need to feel safe. There needs to be a perception that these areas welcome pedestrians and make walking a pleasant experience for them. Now, one way that some cities have been opting for is to basically remove cars from their urban core entirely. In fact, all the cities in every Pokemon game are car free. Cars are very seldom seen in these games at all. That being said though, for most American cities, it's possible that they could start developing car-free urban cores, but highly unlikely that it would ever come to fruition. So instead, cars need to more so be put in their place and the pedestrian elevated to where that activity is encouraged. And the key to that is to calm the speed of traffic. While it could be easier to just slap some lower speed limit signs and set up some speed traps, those tend to not really affect speeds all that much. What affects the speed that people go is not usually a number on a sign, but more typically the actual design of the road. That is, roads that are perceived by drivers as being more dangerous tend to cause them to drive slower. This concept is referred to as risk homeostasis. Speck puts it the following way. Risk homeostasis describes how people automatically adjust their behavior to maintain a comfortable level of risk. It explains why poisoning deaths went up after childproof caps were introduced people stopped hiding their medicines, and why the deadliest intersections in America are typically ones you can navigate with one finger on the steering wheel and a cell phone at your ear. And so there are various ways to calm traffic. One such way that Speck notes in his book is by the placement of trees. And when you look at most North American cities, the street design has a fairly notable absence of trees, usually favoring larger clear zones, at least when they don't also try to cram a bike lane in there, which is ridiculous and there's a reason no one really uses them. What's noted is that speeding is usually more prevalent on roads that have these large clear zones, i.e. more ability for error, whereas a street lined with trees will increase that sense of risk homeostasis. On top of that, they also create a barrier between the cars and pedestrians. Beyond just the fact that they make people drive slower and create a barrier for pedestrians, they also make cities more pleasant to walk in, usually decreasing the ambient temperature by about five to 15 degrees. They also tend to act as a carbon sink for the cars driving in the streets. And lastly, each mature tree planted on a city street can absorb up to half an inch of rainwater per rainfall, which helps with maintaining city sewer systems and making sure they don't overflow. And this is something that when you look at the cities in different Pokemon games, I didn't see a whole lot of. Not a whole lot of cities tended to place trees on, at least in the games. You see it a bit in some places like Celadon City and a few others, but by and large, a lot of Pokemon games don't tend to put too many trees within the city itself, at least in the games. If you look at in the anime, for example, the way Heart Home City is depicted, there are trees galore, but it's not just slow speeds that encourage walking. We also need to create areas that pedestrians can reasonably walk in. That is, we need to start tearing down some of the separation between residential and commercial areas. Essentially, what is referred to as mixed use development. So most of America is zoned as what's considered R1 zoning or single family only, which means that more dense housing options as well as commercial businesses are not allowed. And this tends to encourage personal automobile use due to the fact that as I've already explained, these neighborhoods tend to be further away by walking, requiring a car to get places, but also placing you pretty far away from actual things you might want to engage with. Speck puts it in the following way. What is the balance? Better to ask, what do humans do? Work, shop, eat, drink, learn, recreate, convene, worship, heal, visit, celebrate, sleep. 
These are all activities that people should not have to leave downtown to accomplish. And again, this is something that you see very prevalently in a lot of Pokemon cities. You have a lot of towns that the Pokemon Center is directly adjacent to people's houses. And while most of the starting towns have an issue of only really having people's houses and maybe the professor's lab, which is hence why I use the example of Twinleaf Town in my intro, we actually see a great example of a mixed-use area in Aspertia City where we have a good mix of single family homes that the player and their rival live in, as well as more dense living options in the city, and also access to the Pokemon Center and a school, all of which can be accessed by walking and not leaving the town to go to Route 19. Another fantastic example of this is actually found in Unova's Nimbasa City, which places more dense living arrangements near a lot of really great things for people to have access to, including sporting events, musicals, a theme park, and most importantly, transit. The placement of Gear Station in the middle of the city, near people's homes, is a great thing for the city. And it's one of the major things that helps with walkability in cities, is for those longer distances, if you can give people options that are reasonably frequent and have similar time to taking a car, people will use them. Usually the issue that cities run into is sort of this chicken and egg problem. The city is not really designed to encourage transit usage, but in order to have a city where people use transit, you need to actually have good working transit. And it's not just having transit in a closer knit walkable area that makes people want to walk in an area. You need to also make it visually appealing and give people options, something that as a gamer, hopefully you should be tuned into preferring in level design. This comes mainly through internal passages in blocks, which Spec puts in the following way. The more blocks per square mile, the more choices a pedestrian can make, and the more opportunities there are to alter your path to visit a useful address such as a coffee shop or a dry cleaner. And this is a thing that some cities, namely Barcelona, have taken to a bit of an extreme with the introduction of what's known as the super block. That is, blocks bounded on all four sides by major arterial roads that cars use, but with internal streets that are primarily centered around pedestrian and bike usage, oftentimes closed to through traffic only really allowing vehicles in if people say live there and need to park their car or for last mile delivery. Finding an example of this is a bit hard just due to the fact that the Pokemon world, as I mentioned, sort of lacks cars, but I think I found one in the city of Medali in the Paldea region, where you have this major road that cuts across the edge of the town, but once you get inside, outside of one exit on the other side, the internal corridors of the street don't easily allow you to travel directly through them. You have to go on that main road onto the street which means if you're passing through, you don't go in those, which is ultimately what you're looking for in a super block design. And lastly, a city can have all of the hallmarks of good walkable design that encourage pedestrian activity, but that's nothing if there's nothing to do, which is why you need to make sure that pedestrians are thoroughly entertained, so to speak. There are options for them to do stuff and things that won't get monotonous or boring. You need to obviously have grocery stores, doctors and whatnot, but you also are going to really need to have stuff that keeps people entertained. As I mentioned, Nimbasa City has Big Stadium and Little Court, as well as the Pokemon Musical Hall and an amusement park, and that's something that helps create life in a city and makes it more walkable. Other great cities that are shining examples of great walkable areas are Castilla City and Lumio City, both of which have tons of activity and exploration potential in them, even if it's a little hard to explore Lumio City due to the fact that there's no minimap. But ultimately, that's what makes these cities great, is that they have a lot of potential for you to find things if you just explore. You don't have to engage with any of the activities in these cities in either the Unova games or in X and Y. You are completely up to your own devices to find and seek out these things. And what's more notably, in the case of Nimbasa City, daily events are a fairly prominent feature there, which helps keep it fresh and keeps you wanting to come back to see what has changed that particular day. And ultimately, those are just a few things that make cities a pleasant place to live in. And yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are a bit limited due to the fact that these are video games, but at the end of the day, we tend to design video game cities based off of what we see as good cities to be in and what's gonna make a good experience for the player, which can thus extend to what makes a good experience for pedestrians. And that's honestly why I wanted to make this video, just to sort of maybe use the vessel of Pokemon to sort of get you thinking a bit more about what could potentially be improved with the design of American cities. 
And that's really all we can do is just get people thinking, get people sort of demanding their local governments to take action to make cities a safer, more attractive place for pedestrians and not a place that you just drive your car through to another destination. And with that, I'm going to leave you guys. Thanks for watching.